Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Podcast. I'm joined this morning, as always, by co-host Matt Carter. And today we're going to talk about last night's 76-73 road loss to Syracuse that the NC State Wolfpack suffered. They dropped to 3-5 and five in ACC play, 7-6 and six overall. But before we get too far into this episode, this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. With interest rates below 3%, there has never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you are guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Hunter Clawson a call today at 480-513-3992 or email Hunter directly at hclawson.com at jfqlending.com. That's H-C-L-A-U-S-S-E-N at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending, Inc., Equal Access Lender, licensed in over 40 states, www.jfqlending.com. And while you're at it, head over to thewolfpacker.com and use promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free 60-day trial on all of our premium content, news, and analysis. Um... And of course, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and if you're watching us on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and give this video a thumbs up. Okay, Matt, let's talk about Sunday evening's NC State Road Law 76-73 Syracuse comes out on top. Um, And I think where I want to start with this one is we'll obviously get to the you know, elephant in the rooms, NC State playing this game without its two leading scorers. First, fifth-year senior guard Devin Daniels is out. He suffered a season-ending ACL tear in the Wednesday win over Wake Forest. You already knew you were going without him, but then an hour before tip-off, you also learn you're going without your second leading scorer on this team, fifth-year senior forward DJ Funderburk, citing... uh, uh, university policies as the reason why he is not uh, or he was not able to go Sunday evening in the Carrier Dome. He did make the trip with the Wolfpack, however. He was seen practicing with the team but did not play yesterday and is unknown when his status will return. I do want to get to those two things and maybe how they impacted the game, but I think to start I want to talk about the differences between the first half and the second half. Just kind of what you noticed what you know, Coach Keats told us after the game. This is not the first time that this has happened this season. For the fourth time this year, NC State has had a halftime lead and has ultimately lost. You know, you look at those four different games, even if you're able to just split those games, we're talking about a completely different trajectory of a season at this point in the year. Um, but last night, I thought NC State had its best first I thought it had its best half of basketball there in the first half. They scored 47 points on the Syracuse Orange. uh, We're leading by nine points at halftime. You know, I thought the defense was not excellent, but I thought it was good enough to build that type of lead. The ball movement was phenomenal. The shots were dropping. And then in the second half, you know, State showed signs of that, but just never was able to really get the ball through the hole enough um, to keep pace with Syracuse. Syracuse outscores NC State 38-26 to in the second half, pulls away with the three-point victory, and ultimately Syracuse took its last lead with about five minutes and some change left in this game. NC State was able to cut it to a one-point game twice in that final stretch, but just was never able to make enough collective stops to ultimately take back the lead. So Matt, what do you make of the A, just what did you see last night in terms of the differences between the first half and the second half? Did you see any adjustments that Syracuse made that may have prompted that? Or do you agree with head coach Kevin Keats' postgame comments that, you know, simply the ball just wasn't dropping for the pack? And then B, um, you know, what's the deal with this? It's, it's, it's a pattern at this point. You know, NC State is just has proven to be a solid first half team, and they just can't seem to, you know, to close out these games. Not only when they have a lead at halftime, but when they have a lead in the final ten minutes of the game. So, um, your thoughts on those two things, Matt? 
Yeah, in the first, I thought the one adjustment Syracuse made is, you know, in the first half, NC State had a lot of success um, with the with Jericho Holmes about 15 feet away from the basket. He probably had three or four assists to Manny Bates for dunks. Um, I think what you saw is Syracuse kind of um, extending a little bit out towards Helen, but also covering the baseline better and taking away that option for Helms. And so they were, in essence, trying to take away the entry pass, if you will, to Helms. And then if Helms got it, they were trying to take away the baseline pass at that point. And so that had something to do with it. Uh, but I also think Kevin Keats is right. I think the shots just were not falling. Uh, you know, Helms missed a couple of those shots that he was making in the first half from about 15 feet away. Uh, ultimately, I think what Syracuse did is put the ball in the hands of the, the perimeter guards. Mm-hmm. And other than Beverly, none of them shot well last night. Um, in the first half, the field goal percentage was largely due to the ball being mainly going to Hollands, uh, Bates, and a little bit of Beverly. In the second half, it was more guys like Shaquille Moore and uh, Thomas Allen getting – and. Uh, getting shots off and and they just were not falling. Um, And so, yeah, that was, um, that was the big, big reason why they, I think that they just didn't struggle. They struggled with the shot in the second half. I think you got to give Syracuse credit. You could tell very early in the second half that they were uh, amping it up a little bit, particularly on offense. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I I still go back to, I, you know, if you're going in the 70s, that should be enough to win a game. But, the, you know, you can't check. You shot 46% last night, made eight of 21 threes. And they only turned the ball over 10 times. And if we talked about state needs to get turnovers, particularly now without Devin Daniels, who's your best man to man half court offensive player, you got to get them turnovers and got to get points off turnovers. They, they didn't do that against Syracuse. Uh, I don't know if there's really a, a pattern to the second half thing. I think each game takes on its own unique characteristics. You know, St. Louis stands out, or that was because they were dead on their legs. Um, you know, they, they were at it. They, they were the first game back after an extended pause, a few players, um, and they just ran out of gas. You know, um, uh this game was just a tale of two halves. It happens sometimes. Um, I think Syracuse would flip the script and say, you know, why didn't we play like this in the first half? Right. And the, 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 the second half. Uh, Clemson, you know, that was just a matter of they were right there. They had it. Yeah. It was a very similar game until about 30 seconds left mm-hmm. when – they let the game get tight. I'm for, I don't. I'm blanking on the fourth one. You said they let it halftime. They te- they let it halftime of the Miami game. Uh, in Miami, that was just a game where the ball just wasn't going, right? Going in the basket, right? Um, so I'm not sure that there's a rhyme or reason to it. So every game just kind of took a different characteristic. Um, I do think in this game the youth showed up a little bit in the second half, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, nobody. That, that's not a. Every coach goes to that excuse, right? Where young team that the go-to excuse whenever you're struggling. It the chapter uh, first sentence in chapter one of the coach's book on how to explain a struggling threat. We're young, right? Um, but in this case, they were legitimately young, and I think that showed up a little bit. Well, I I agree with that sentiment. I I definitely think last night's second half collapse if you will I mean collapse I don't know if is an appropriate word because NC State did stay in that game till the final stretch they easily could have you know let one of those Syracuse runs go out of control um, particularly considering you're without your two top scorers you're without your two most experienced players on this team I mean those are two fifth year senior guys and when you're without them a, a somewhat young team becomes even younger um and, you know, you look back at those three previous times where NC State um, lost a, f- a halftime lead. You know, St. Louis, veteran team on the road after a break. Understandable. Uh, Clemson, a veteran team. Now, 
they are seeming to have their own sort of collapse here in conference play, losing three of the last four um, by over 20 points or more. But at that point in time, we were looking at Clemson as arguably the best team in the conference. As with NC State, of course, both of those two programs have taken quite a nosedive since then in the month of January. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you can't discount Clemson's experience on that team, maybe why they had such a strong non-conference uh, slate, why they had such a strong start to the season. Miami, I mean, they were without their two leading scorers in that game, but they're still, you know, they still had some guys that have been around the league. I still think NC State, you know, that was probably the head scratcher that NC State wishes they could get back. But even the Syracuse team, you know, you look at their comparison. I mean, Syracuse doesn't run exactly, you know, they don't they don't rely on their bench very much. I they actually went to their bench more so than they typically do. I think they played nine deep last night, if I'm not mistaken. Highlighted by that uh, that tall guard, Kadari Richmond, who scored 14 points in 16 minutes. Had Jim Beheim gone to him a little bit sooner in the second half, I don't think we're talking about a single dig or a one possession game because man, Richmond, the different the difference between him and Joe Girard in the game for the Orange was stark. Uh, NC State just didn't have an answer uh, defending him on the perimeter. I think that's where you really miss a Devin Daniels. Darian Sebron did his best, but again, you know, he's playing in his 12th game of his college career, not even. I mean, he's not a guy that's played in every single game this season. Um, so, you know, the training wheels are still on for him. Uh, I agree with your points about, you know, Shaquille Moore and, and – not necessarily Cam Hayes. I thought Cam Hayes actually had a really good game yesterday in terms of being an offensive facilitator in the absence of Devin Daniels. He didn't take, he didn't make shots, but he didn't take a lot of shots, so I'm not going to ding him for that. Shaquille Moore, I think he put up about eight shots. A lot of them seemed to be in the second half, and it just wasn't his offensive night. Um, he went two of eight from the field, one of five from three. I mean, that's just a lot of three-point shots to take if you're, not, if you're only going to make one. I um, think he tied for the lead of three-point attempts along with Thomas Allen, Braxton, Beverly. Not necessarily what your goal is going into a game. Um, but let's talk about the elephant in the room. And I do want to get to Jericho Helms and uh, Manny Bates because they both play phenomenally. And you know, if you don't get those type of performances from those guys, you're not you're not looking at a game that's you know potentially an NC State quad one win, their first of the season. What, what would have been? Um, but with, uh, with DJ Funderburk out, in addition to Devin Daniels out, what impact do you think that made on the game specifically for this matchup against Syracuse with the zone? Um, and what impact do you think it could have moving forward? Because we don't know, you know when DJ Funderburk could potentially return. It could be a one-game thing. It could be multiple games based on the way Coach Keats was talking after the game Sunday night. Yeah, and um, to your point earlier, I mean, Syracuse really only played in this game. It was six guys. Uh, they did play a couple other guys off the bench, but one was two minutes, one was one minute. Right. But I did make I did make Kadari Richmond my player of the game. And I, I mentioned that because that's where you saw the absence of a Devin Daniels. Was, yeah, I doubt Kadari Richmond would have gotten to the lane at will. Uh, he was 67, and I think all of his six shots that he made were within five feet of the basket. Um, mm -hmm. You don't normally see a guard do that, but he was a 6'5 freshman guard. And, you know, Seabon, I think, got the last shot at him on defense. Uh, but before that, it was basically just using his height over the other three guards, which is an issue that – or four guards, which is an issue NC State's going to face. You know, Cam Hayes is the lot tallest at six three. I, you know, there are a lot of us who don't who wonder if he's really six foot three. Um, and so they, they, they just used the height and backed it down, and that's where not having your six foot five Devin Daniels, who ball defender, and one of the better shot blocking guards you will see in the country. He's actually a very good shot blocker mm -hmm. for the position. Uh, and not having him hurt there. And, uh, and then Funderburg, you know, I'm not sure State missed him that much last night. And I think we can go ahead and mention why. You know, I had Jericho Helms with 24 yeah. and 9. 
Uh, Manny Bates was 17 and 14. They did their job. And I think what you're looking at is without those two guys, you need guys. Obviously, people have to step up. Uh, for NC State, the three most veteran players stepped up. You know, Beverly had 11 points, four assists, zero turnovers in 36 minutes. I'd take that out of my point guard seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and he made three or five threes. That is exactly what you want from Braxton Beverly. Um, yeah, he got beat a few times on defense. He's just going to have to accept that. Um, but at least he competed on defense. Now, we meant Manny Bates. You know, extremely efficient around the rim. I didn't take him one 15-foot shot. Didn't take a bad shot. Um, made made most of his free throws. Four block shots. You got exactly what you wanted out of Manny Bates. Helms, you know, the five turnovers were an issue. I think part of that is the product of him having the ball a lot in the Joan offense. I'm not sure that's going to be as much of an issue going forward. But to get 24 points and nine rebounds and also four assists, in 37 minutes, that's exactly what you want. Ultimately, you know, you need Thomas Allen to be a little bit better for a year, and he's, he's been three games slump shooting the basketball. You know, ultimately, if NC State going to survive their absence, depending on how long Thunderbird is out, and win games, you know, it's probably not realistic to expect a gaudy number from Helms and Bates every night. Um, right. That would make them – ACC player of the year, first team all ACC, and et cetera, et cetera. You're going to need Cam Hayes, Shaquille Moore. And I thought Sebron stepped up nine points uh, last night, and he just kind of displayed the game. I think he can be or two rebounds, two assists, a block shot, two steals. He's really that stat stuffing guy who doesn't necessarily need the basketball in his hands on offense to make a difference. Kind of what a young uh, yeah. Devin Daniels was a couple years back. Exactly. And then, of course, you know, they're going to need Hayes and Moore to step up, particularly from a scoring standpoint. And, you know, Hayes, you know, I looked at it last night in his last five games. He's six for 27 from the field, which is, you know, almost 20%. Uh, at this point, I think it's 22.5% or something like that from the field. Uh, you know, he's going through his first slump. You know, he, he hasn't done this before in college. We'll see how he comes out of that slump. Uh, you might still had four assists, a couple of turnovers. Um, and then Shaquille Moore, you're just going to have to accept that you know, it's going to be the up and down. Uh, we've seen that. Great against UNC, great against Boston College. Had a real nice game against uh, Wake Forest last time out. You know, it seems the road games might be giving him a little bit more issues than the home games. Um, maybe the comfort of being in PNC versus away from the familiar environment might be a little bit of that freshman in him. Um, and this is a team, by the way, that has not won a road game this year, a true road game. They, they did beat UMass Lyle uh, in a neutral setting. They're dying uh, they, for some ice cream. Yeah, they've yet to have that first uh, road win. So ultimately, look, if you're going to survive those absence, we have to be real and say those two guards, Hayes and Moore, have got to step up some scoring. Um, and that just means Hayes has got to get out of his slump. I do like the fact that he's not forcing shots. You mentioned he was 0 for 3. One of those with the last Hail Mary attempt there by the sideline that had no chance to go in. Um, but, you know, he took a couple other threes that may have been a little bit forced, but he's not really forcing a whole mo a whole lot. And I think, you know, that kind of maybe the lesson Shaquille Moore has got to learn here is, don't try to force it. I thought, I, saw, I thought some of those threes were open looks that he took. They just didn't fall in. But to me, you know, you know you saw Bates and Hallam. You, you can probably count on them to be your leaders, but they're, they're not going to give you that every night. You need Hayes and you need more and you need Seabon to show some consistency in what he gave last night. You need Thomas Allen to step up as well. I mean, Thomas Allen, I think at this point, has got to be a guy giving you 10 points a game. Well, maybe you take him off the bench at this point because, I mean, again, last night he did make one three, but one of five from, from three, just like Shaquille Moore. You know, you, you, you're you not going to win many games if Thomas Allen is shooting at the same click as Shaquille Moore. I mean, Thomas Allen, had, he comes in with the scouting report as this team's best perimeter shooter right now. Braxton Beverly is that guy. 
there's certainly been stretches where Thomas Allen has earned that claim, that two-game stretch where he came off the bench. He went 8 of 10 from the three-point land. Um, I mean, that's not a that's not a sustainable efficiency, but what I'm saying is maybe there is some rhyme and reason to that. Um, you know, the freshman guard, Shaquille when, uh, and Cam Hayes, and like last, together. Yep, in his last three games, I have won for 11 on yep. three-pointers. So – Kind of what you're, and really, I mean, Hayes is also a good shooter. So you need those two guys to join Beverly. I mean, those are supposed to be your most, three most consistent shooters mm-hmm. uh, from the perimeter. So, um, but anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. I mean, I'm I'm also looking at these uh, usage numbers. Just you know, in terms of how many time or what percent of possessions is the ball going to a particular player when they're on the floor. You look at Devin Daniels, he led the team with 25.6% usage rate this season. You take him out, you're going to get you're going to see everybody's numbers jump. But last night just for reference, Jericho Hellams uh 36.8% usage rate, so he was highly involved. Don't expect his numbers to stay that high, but I do think he'll end up being one of the biggest benefactors of Daniels' absence. But then just for comparison, Shaquille Moore, 32.5% usage rate. I guarantee you a lot of that was in the second half in crunch time where you started to see those Syracuse runs go. So, um, you know, those were the two guys above 30. Darian Sebron, 23.6. That's a high usage rate for him and definitely his season high. I think he had a season high or career high at this point, 17 minutes last night. I was really encouraged from what I saw from Darian Sebron. You know, minus the – you know, the foul that he probably wishes he could have take back on that final defensive possession that NC State had. You know, State was down two points at that point, I want to say. Uh, shot clock was dwindling down to six with, I think, maybe 30 or 20 seconds left. NC State would have gotten another possession had they gotten a stop on the defensive end. And Sebron completely yeah. bails out Syracuse. And it was a possession the where, yeah, that possession wasn't going well. You know, they did. Syracuse did what was smart, but they got the ball into the hands of Richmond, who State couldn't. And that was the possession where Sebron was clearly his athleticism and quickness was bothering. Mm-hmm. Um, was bothering. Uh, what's it? Uh, Richmond. Yeah. On the other end of the, on that end of the court, and and you could see it was going to be a fourth shot. I mean, Richmond were going to shoot the ball, but you're right; they were down to about six seconds in the shot clock, and he was not in a position. To get a good shot off, it was toward the free throw line where he was over aggressive reaching in. And at that point, it's just a matter of holding your ground and being long and uh, rookie mistake. But I, I know why he was that aggressive because he had come close to taking the ball from Richmond a, a couple of times there. And uh, what really hurt was NC State only had two team fouls. So, it, you know. You're right. If it. <laughs> And it was with uh, a little over 20 seconds left when he committed the foul. And, and then they got to play hacker foul because now the shot clock resets and they can run out the clock. And so you had to foul a whole bunch of times. And Syracuse, is, as we learned last night, Syracuse is not the team you want to be uh, forcing no. to go to the free throw line late they, in the game. They were already the best free throw shooting team uh, in the ACC entering this contest. So that was the correct coaching decision is to hold off the dogs there play it true you're going to have a much better percentage of them getting zero points and you get the ball back if you just play it straight up and fouling them where they shoot roughly 75 80 percent from the line i mean Kadari richmond was the worst free throw shooter on the court at that time he's a 72 percent free throw shooter so um you know tough break for nc state i think the deadly sin in that scenario is if you're gonna foul don't let 20 seconds dwindle off the shot clock. Precious time in that final minute, particularly when you had to foul four more times to get into the bonus, I believe, at that point. Um, but anyways, up next for NC State, unless you got any other points you want to make before we get to game balls, Matt, but up next for NC State will be a hungry, mad Virginia team coming off of a second-half slip of their own against a rival in Virginia Tech. Um, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. in PNC Arena. So, NC State's got its work cut out for them. 
potentially facing one of the top two teams in the ACC coming up. We'll see if DJ Funderburk will be back. That's a game that they could definitely use him back for. Um, but let's go ahead and give our game balls out. I think it's quite obvious. <laughs> and no, you can't give your game ball to Kadari Richmond, Matt. <sighs> I get, I'll give it to um, Manny Bates because I think the 14 rebounds were were huge. I, you know, Helm just getting nine rebounds was pretty significant as well, but also four black shots and seven, to go with 17 points. I, I kind of thinking last night, Manny Bates is what Syracuse needs. If, if Syracuse had Manny Bates, they'd be really set. Um, yeah. Um, but they don't, thank goodness. The first time uh, – Syracuse had been out rebounded in a game and lost, and NC State's not a good rebounding team. Um, but they out rebounded Syracuse because Bates gave them that. You know, Kevin Keith said he'd been that one of the two missing pieces for Manny Bates. It, uh, you know, kind of a consistent offensive game beyond dunking the basketball, and also being a consistently very good rebounder. Um, and that was kind of a breakthrough, hopefully a breakthrough for Manny Bates in terms of rebounding the basketball. Um, you know, fouled out. That would, you know, if I were to question one decision for Kevin Keats, it didn't matter in the long run, but, you know, they were not set up well for overtime. If that game had gone into overtime, they would have been in deep trouble because Manny Bates and Shebron had fouled out. And I think that's a situation where you needed to do some offense, defense, or, you know, Hacker, hacker guy, non-hacker guy, strategy, if you will, and and one, you know, Bates and Chibon don't need to be out there fouling guys. They were the only two guys fouling guys, and uh, so he ends up fouling out. But that was not a product of foul trouble. Um, so he stayed on the court. He was very good, and I'll let you give Helms the other game ball. Well, I was going to make one last point from what you were saying about Syracuse. If they had Manny Bates, well, they'd be really good. Well, I'll counter that back. If NC State had Alan Griffin right now, they'd be really good. They'd be a tournament team, Matt. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Griffin's been up and down. If you give him Bayheim, Buddy Bayheim, although he had been struggling recently. No, um, I'll take I'll take Alan Griffin all day over Buddy Bayheim, yeah. but um, not to discount Bayheim. he's just been a cold cold shooter this year tough tough stretch for him this year and i think he had covid so he's been battling back with his conditioning so understandable um but yeah i'll go ahead and give it to jericho helms obviously uh career high 24 points for helms nine rebounds those were really big i think three of them were on the offensive glass um that was one area that nc state was actually pretty impressive yesterday was on the offensive glass i think they out rebounded Syracuse 11 to eight um, on offensive rebounds, and I think they outscored them um, by about four or five points on second chance points. But um, four assists for Jericho Helms that has to be towards his season high. I don't have it right in front of me, um, but yeah, he was just the facilitator of that offense. I think that's what makes last night disappointing is that when you have a guy like Jericho Helms who is that perfect. Um, guy to infiltrate that Syracuse zone and it was working so effectively for a majority of that game um you know you really want to come away and, and steal one on the road get your first road victory get your first quad one victory of the year but of course they weren't able to capitalize on that late it seemed like Syracuse was able to finally catch on there in the final stretch prevent him from getting the ball near that ACC logo but it was very pretty basketball for that first half when he was able to get the ball and facilitate the offense. So Jericho Helms, NC State will need more strong scoring performances from him. They're going to need more consistency from their junior forward from St. Louis moving forward, particularly yeah. considering the volume score you lose in Devin Daniels now. I was going to add one thing. Obviously, the ball movement was, was more uh... – noticeable last night we i think at the first half they had 17 assists on 19 made baskets i would just throw out a cautionary tale for listeners who you know i had a lot of people say oh look when uh, the ball is moving much better because devin daniels is not uh the predominant guy with the ball in his hands you know that was his own offense and to go back and look and see they traditionally had good ball movement against zone offenses it's one of the reasons why they're not zoned that much to be honest with you, um, by the other teams. So 
I think a bigger test would be well, let's see what they look like when they go back to the man to man defenses here. Mm -hmm. uh, not Virginia. Virginia is an impossible team to pass, pile up the assist stat total, unless you're getting Jagger or something like that. But, uh, you know, down the road, I think Boston College also runs its own defense. So next week, we'll get a good look at what the offense really looks like. Well, we will wait and see what Wednesday looks like. I think you got to count on uh, probably a bad game from Virginia for that one to be close. But we will see. It's, uh, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. in PNC Arena. Um, scheduled. Scheduled, of course. Of course. The first one <laughs> the first one was postponed. NC State was supposed mm -hmm. to travel up to Charlottesville, I think, right after that Miami loss. Um, but nonetheless, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Google Play. If you're watching us on YouTube, um, like this video or give it a thumbs up rather and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you can follow us on social media at The Wolfpacker. You can follow me personally at Justin H. Will. Give us a like on Facebook, NC State Wolfpack on the Wolfpacker.com. And lastly, use that promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free 60 day trial on all of our premium content, news, and analysis at the Wolfpacker.com. For Matt Carter, this is Justin Williams, and this has been the Wolfpacker Podcast.